Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Sierra Lau, and I'm part of the California School-Based Health Alliance. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Adolescent Substance Use Engagement and Treatment Options. This is the first webinar in a five-part series on youth and substance use prevention. Um, we would like to thank our funders, Cal the California Youth Opioid Response, for supporting this project. A few housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded. The recording and slides will be posted on our website and emailed to you after today's uh, webinar. And we're going to be answering questions throughout. However, there are quite a, people that are, quite a few people that are supposed to be joining us today, so we might need to pause questions and hold until the end. A little bit about the California School-Based Health Alliance. We are a statewide nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the health and academic success uh, of children and youth by advancing health services in schools. We do that in two ways, advocating for more school-based health centers, as well as supporting and improving those existing school-based health centers. Uh, we do this through policy, capacity building, technical assistance, workshops and webinars like today, and there is a link to our website where you can find uh, the recording and the slides as well as additional resources. We do have our 2022 conference coming up. Thanks to those who joined us for our 2021 conference that just happened at the beginning of November. Um, but this one is going to be April 29th. It is right now in person at the University of Redlands in San Bernardino. So we hope to see you there. And if you aren't already, uh, we do have a membership. And through that membership, you can get conference registration discounts to the conference that I just showed on the previous slide. Uh, we also provide technical assistance tailored to your organizational needs. And there is a link to sign up to become a member. So we have two wonderful presenters joining us today. Uh, James Peck is going to start off by giving us an overview of the epidemiology of substance use in youth, strategies for engaging and retaining youth in treatment, and brief overviews of the medications and behavioral interventions. And then Lisa Eisenberg is going to uh, tell us about the importance of connecting school-based interventions and treatment services to non-punitive discipline approaches to student substance use at schools. OK, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Jim. He is a licensed clinical psychologist and senior clinical trainer at the UCLA Integrated Substance Abuse Programs. For nearly a decade, Dr. Peck has conducted phase two clinical trials of behavioral and pharmacological interventions for stimulant dependence. Dr. Peck has extensive experience conducting curriculum development, clinical trainings, and clinical supervision on the etiology assessment and treatment of substance-related disorders and on the treatment of individuals with co-occurring substance-related and psychiatric disorders. He currently works at UCLA in a primarily clinical training role and maintains a busy practice treating individuals with co-occurring disorders. So I'm going to go ahead and stop my share and pass it over to Jim. Perfect. Thank you, Sierra. Should be able to see my slides now. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Nice to have you with us all. Uh, it's nice to be back with you all, uh, speaking with you again on this really important topic. And we're going to be talking today about adolescent substance use with a particular focus on stimulants and opioids. Uh, and then we'll talk about engagement and treatment approaches. And Bernie just put it in the chat box. And as Sierra said, I will do my best. Uh, feel free to put questions in the chat box. I'll, I'll do my best to get to them as they come in. However, there are a lot of you and one of me. And so if it turns out that there are a lot of questions coming in, I may defer them. Uh, until the end, just to make sure that we can get through all of the material. So what we'd like to be able to do today is, is after the webinar, we'd like you to be able to recognize recent prevalence rates of at least three types of illicit and prescription stimulants and opioids used by youth. So we're talking about illicit stimulants and opioids, as well as prescription stimulants and opioids. We'd like you to be able to apply at least two strategies to help engage and retain youth in treatment for substance use disorders and co-occurring mental health conditions, which often go hand in hand. And identify at least two evidence-based substance use tr disorder treatment approaches that can be implemented with use, youth who are using stimulants and or opioids. I just added this quote 
this morning. Uh, I came across my desk uh, about an hour ago, and I thought it was really relevant to you all. This is from Vivek Murthy, Murthy, the Surgeon General of the United States. And here's what the statement that he issued on the youth mental health crisis. Mental health challenges in children, adolescents, and young adults are real and widespread, even, even before the, the pandemic. An alarming number of young people struggled with feelings of helplessness, depression, and thoughts of suicide, and rates have increased over the past decade. The COVID-19 pandemic further altered their experiences at home, school, and in the community, and the effect on their mental health has been devastating. The future well-being of our country depends on how we support and invest in the next generation, especially in this moment, as we work to protect the health of Americans in the face of a new variant, we also need to focus on how we can emerge stronger on the other side. This advisory shows us how we can all work together to step up for our children during this dual crisis. Um, I think that this was really, as I said, really relevant to the work that all of you are doing, uh, which is why I just added this this morning. Okay, a little bit on epi epidemiology, uh, uh, looking at the prevalence of stimulant and opioid use in particular among adolescents. Some of this data comes from uh, Monitoring the Future Study 2019. Some of the uh, information comes from 2020. 2020 was kind of a, a strange year because of the pandemic. Some of the uh, surveys that are normally done on an annual basis uh, were had to be modified. And so we don't have as much information from 2020 as we might like to have. So some of the information I'll be giving you is from 2019 and some of, some of it is from 2020. So in terms of illicit drug use, um, any illicit drug use held pretty much steady, has held pretty much steady or come down if, a little bit, if anything, uh, from 1997 through 2019, held steady from 2018 to 2019. Any illicit drug not including marijuana uh, came down as well slightly from 2018 to 2019. And by far the most commonly used substance among 12th graders is marijuana. Vicodin and Oxycontin. So we're, as we said, talking about opioids and stimulants today. Opioids uh, include things like Vicodin and Percocet and Oxycontin. And we've seen a real decline in the use of prescription opioid painkillers uh, over the last 10 years or so, really. Uh, it's come down, especially among 12th graders. Eighth graders, it came down through 2014 and then has pretty much leveled out through 2019. Whereas with 10th and 12th graders, it has continued to decline uh, down to about 1.1%, which is a fairly small percentage. And Oxycontin is the same. Oxycontin is a, another type of uh, opioid painkiller. And you can see it among 12th and 10th graders, it has come down uh, significantly. Among 8th graders, there's actually a little bit of a rise from 2014 to 2019. And this mirrors kind of the picture that we're seeing among 8th graders, which is using more prescription stimulants and opioids. And then as they progress through high school, shifting from the prescription stimulants and opioids to uh, illicit stimulants and opioids. Adderall misuse uh, sees a significant change in the past five years, uh, 10th and 12th graders. Again, we see a decrease here among these two categories. However, and eighth grade, among eighth graders, an increase, almost a double uh, increase between 2014 and 2019. So Adderall is one of those prescription stimulants uh, that is being used by eighth graders, primarily. And if we look at amphetamine, inhalant, and cough medicine misuse uh, has been trending upward also among eighth graders. Cough medicine, which as you know, sometimes contains things like codeine, which is an opioid, sometimes contains alcohol as well. And through 2020, between 2019 and 2020, saw a significant increase uh, in all three types of substances, 
among eighth graders. So cough medicine is the dark blue bar. Amphetamines are the light blue, lighter blue bar. And that would be things like Ritalin and Adderall. And the very light blue is inhalants. Inhalants is more of a category of substances rather than a single substance, uh, like Ritalin or Adderall or single substances. Inhalants are things that can be huffed, that can be snorted, uh, typically some sort of volatile solvent that is inhaled. Randy, yeah, I think that's a really good, uh, really good question. Do you believe the rise could be caused by masking mental health issues? Um, there are a couple of studies I'm going to show you that indicate that that is likely the case, that there is a lot of underlying mental health, uh, a lot of underlying mental health issues going on that are likely being self-medicated with substances. It's a really good, really good question. If we look at past year cocaine use among people to age 12 and older from 2002 to 2019, uh, we see that Cocaine use is down from 2017 to 2019 uh, among 18 to 25 year olds. 18 to 25 year olds tend to be the group that uses these substances more than others. 12 to 17, which is the age group that most concerns you folks, uh, it actually has come down gradually from the early 2000s and remained fairly constant through 2019. Past year methamphetamine use, which is another stimulant, uh, 2015 to 2019. Um, meth use continues to be the lowest uh, among 12 to 17 year olds. That's the gray line down here at the bottom and highest among, again, 18 to 25 year olds. So high school students may be using prescription stimulants like Adderall and Ritalin um, and you and not taking them because they're prescribed for ADHD. So these are medications that are prescribed for ADHD. However, a lot of these kids are taking these medications not because they've been prescribed, but because they're getting them from their friends uh, or from their home medicine chests. The 18 to 25 year olds here uh, have gotten in 2019 to be just about the same as 26 or older. Past year prescription stimulant misuse among people age 12 uh, or older. Highest again among 18 to 25 year olds up here at the top. Uh, and second, last rather among 26 or older, that's the yellow line toward the bottom. 12 to 17 year olds are somewhere in between 26 or older and the overall category of 12 or older. That's your heroin use among people age 12 or older, 2002 to 2019. So again, we see the 18 to 25 year old uh, age range being the greatest, having the greatest use of heroin. Uh, 12 to 17 is the lowest. And there was actually a statistically significant decline from 2017 to 2018. These are, uh, Jaime, these are the National Survey on Drug Use and Health and the Monitoring the Future Study, which is run by NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, their annual surveys. Randy, psychotropic medications include study uh, use. It depends on what you mean by psychotropic medications. So if, you're, if we're looking at things like Adderall and Ritalin as psychotropic medications, then yes, we're including those in what we're talking about. Uh, Psychotropic medications like for, yeah, like for anxiety or depression. No, we're not talking about those. Past year prescription pain reliever misuse. So again, 18 to 25 year olds at the top, although that has been uh, fairly steadily declining through 2019. The 12 to 17 year olds, same thing, a pretty straight line, whoops, from 2015 down through 2019. Uh, slight decline in prescription pain reliever misuse. And that probably represents the overall reduction in availability of prescription pain relievers over the last five years or so as more regulations have kicked in and uh, physicians have become more and more reluctant to prescribe them 
for anything other than something like severe cancer related pain. I thought this was interesting. Reasons that teens report for vaping, and this could be vaping nicotine, it could be vaping THC or marijuana. Uh, yeah, Thomas, the region of studies is, is nationwide. These are national studies. Uh, to experiment, see what it's like, uh, is the most commonly reported reason by 60% of teens in terms of vaping. What's really important here is that those who said to relax or relieve tension that increased by more than a third from 2018 to 2019. That's a large increase. The other one that, that, that more than doubled is because I'm hooked, I have to have it. So part of what this picture is telling me is that the, the person who asked about is mental health uh, potentially involved. Part of what this says to me is that, yeah, teens are, are learning at a, for, at a fairly early age that Vaping, again, whether it's nicotine or uh, THC, helps to relieve tension, helps to relieve stress, helps to relieve anxiety. Uh, and I'll show you another study uh, in a couple of minutes that demonstrates that even further. The other one, because I'm hooked, I have to have it more than doubled. And so we're seeing teens becoming more addicted to vaping uh, rather than just experimenting and to see what it's like. Changes during COVID. So adolescent marijuana use and binge drinking did not significantly change over COVID, despite the perception that availability had decreased. So marijuana perceived availability, so those who felt that it was very or fairly available, went down from 76% to 59% in one year from 2019 to 2020. Alcohol perceived availability. Those who felt that it was very or fairly available went down from 86% to 62% from 2019 and 2020. And these were the largest year to year decreases in perceived availability of marijuana and alcohol since 1975. Yeah, Lee says relaxation and anxiety are the ones I hear almost every time I run a brief intervention. Yeah, absolutely. Um, relaxing, de-stressing from anxiety. Despite the decreases in the perceived availability of alcohol and marijuana, actual use of marijuana and alcohol didn't change. And so what these study authors suggested is that these findings suggest that reducing adolescent substance use through attempts to restrict supply alone would be a difficult undertaking. The best strategy is likely to be one that combines approaches to limit the supply of these substances with efforts to decrease demand through educational and public health campaigns. So if we're just trying to reduce adolescent substance use by reducing supply, we're not likely to be terribly successful. This is from a uh, just study, just published study on school-based health center providers. I thought this was really relevant to all of you. Um, attitudes, beliefs, perceptions, and practice regarding opioid misuse. So only 8%, and this mirrors the adult population as well, only 8% of adolescents who need substance use disorder treatment ever receive it. Part of that is just a lack of treatment beds, a lack of adolescent substance use facilities. Only 1% of the 38,000 physicians waiver to prescribe buprenorphine are pediatricians. So in order to prescribe buprenorphine, also known as Suboxone, uh, to treat opioid use disorder, you have to, if you're a physician, you have to take an eight hour course and apply for a DEA waiver in order to prescribe it. So only 1% of the physicians in the country that currently can prescribe Suboxone are pediatricians, which means youth really don't have much access to this. Youth in adult substance use disorder treatment programs typically experience poor outcomes because their own adolescent specific needs aren't really being addressed in adult programs. And many adolescents engage in at-risk alcohol and marijuana use, which almost always precedes the initiation of opioid use. That doesn't mean that everybody, all adolescents who use alcohol or marijuana are gonna to graduate to opioid use. It does mean that for those who are using opioids, 
they typically have used alcohol and or marijuana prior to the use of the opioid. So this study was conducted with school-based health center providers in New York State, and they assessed their attitudes and perceptions with regard to the opioid crisis. Three quarters of them said opioid overdose is a major health-related crisis for adolescents in this country. 82% said my school-based health center has a role in preventing opioid misuse and overdose. However, only 49% said I have the skills to prevent opioid misuse and overdose among my students. And only about a third of them said I'm confident in my ability to prevent opioid misuse and overdose among my, among my students. So there's a very high perception that opioid overdose is a problem for adolescents and that their school-based health center has a role in preventing it, but providers in general Many of them feel like they don't have the skills in order to make that happen. Some perceived barriers that were reported to implementing opioid misuse and overdose prevention services. About a third of them said adolescents in my school-based health center face other more pressing health concerns. So we don't have time because we have to spend time on other concerns. About a third said substance use disorder treatment providers are better suited for this role than providers in my school-based health center. 26% said, I don't feel confident in my ability to prevent op opioid misuse and overdose. And another quarter said, I'm not trained to deliver services that prevent opioid misuse and overdose. So again, there's the perception of need and yet there's the, the sense of I'm not well prepared to do this. The greatest influence of same study, the greatest influence of specific messages on the adoption and implementation of ESPERT, which I'm assuming you're all familiar with at this point, screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment. ESPERT can prevent adolescent opioid misuse by reducing alcohol and marijuana use. So if we can catch students earlier on in their drug use, we can catch them when they're using alcohol and marijuana, we may be able to prevent them from moving on to opioid misuse. Standardized screening tools uh, like the S2BI or the CRAFT provide a simple way for assessing risk and determining an appropriate level of intervention. So it's standardized in some ways. And the expert model can incorporate other behavioral health concerns like depression and anxiety. You can add in the PHQ-2, let's say for depression or the GAD-7 to assess anxiety. And it is really important to screen for depression and anxiety along with substance use, uh, as we're gonna see in this next slide, actually. This was, a, I thought, a really interesting study published in 2019 um, of a study of over 3,000 high school students in Los Angeles County. And they found that teens who use prescription opioids, so something like Vicodin, when they're younger are more likely to start using heroin by the time they graduate from high school. Uh, study, the study enrolled freshmen followed them through their senior year. It was a racially and ethnically diverse sample, about half Latinx, 17% Asian, 5% African-American population, fairly well split between female and male. But here are the really important pieces of this. 35% of them reported depressive symptoms. That's an enormous percentage of any population to report depressive symptoms. Uh, depression in the general population is about 7% in any given year. So that's five times the rate in the general population of depression. So there are a lot of students who are experiencing depression symptoms. 22% of them reported anxiety symptoms. That is, uh, there's about two to three percent in the general population uh, range of anxiety. So that's about 10 times uh, the range in the general population of anxiety symptoms. So that tells me again, that these are kids who are experiencing mental health symptoms and they are learning in one place or another, whether it's at school or at home, that substances can help alleviate those uh, mental health symptoms. And I say at home, because 70% reported a family history of substance use. So it is very common that kids are learning to use substances at home. I, I think that's 70%, I think is an enormous number. Um, that really kind of blew me away. 
Uh, and almost 600 of the 3,000 students reported prescription opioid use. So again, that's things like Vicodin and OxyContin. Um, so that's about 20% of the 3,000 high school students uh, reported prescription opioid use. Again, that's a very high percentage of any given population. Okay, to talk a little bit about engaging and retaining youth in treatment, whether for substance use or mental health issues. Adolescents often don't believe they need help, and they're not unlike adults in that way in many cases. They're apprehensive about the process. They're not aware of available services. They're concerned about stigma around substance use and or mental health services. And there's different levels of stigma in different communities, different populations. Some communities have more stigma around mental health. Some communities have more stigma around substance use issues. And they're hesitant to ask an adult for assistance. To identify youth in schools who may need help with substance use or mental health issues, use the standardized screening instruments. Don't just go by asking you know, a couple of questions uh, that you think might identify. Use some standardized screening instruments like the CRAFT or the S2BI for substance use, the PHQ-2 or the PHQ-9 for depression. PHQ-2 only has two questions, so it's very quick, uh, very easy to administer. Um, and the GAD-7, which has seven items that assess for anxiety. But I think that we should be, when we're doing SBIRT, I, I really think that we should be using the CRAFT or the S2BI and the PHQ-2 and the GAD-7 to assess for all of those at once. Utilize peer networks uh, and peers have become, uh, in terms of adult treatment, uh, becoming more and more important. So these are student leaders who have been trained to provide assistance to at-risk teens. They may be student leaders who have struggled with substance use or mental health issues themselves. Uh, they may not be, they may just have volunteered to be useful to, to be try to be helpful to their peers. Um, but peers are super important um, because we know that peers have an enormous outsized uh, influence on students. Use something called a cognitive behavioral intervention for trauma in schools, which is a specific intervention to identify traumatic stress, which often accompanies substance use. So it's really important to remember um, when we see adults coming into substance use disorder treatment settings, a very high percentage of them have a trauma history. Most of them are trauma that they experienced in childhood, which means that we need to be screening kids for trauma because often they're coming from homes that are, that are chaotic, where that are abusive, that are neglectful. Um, they're experiencing a parent with mental illness, a parent with substance use disorders, uh, a parent who's been uh, in jail or prison, all kinds of traumatic events. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar by now with the ACEs questionnaire, the Adverse Childhood Experiences uh, questionnaire. It's important to ask students about potential trauma that might be going on at home because that then becomes a reason to use substances to cope. There are frequent high rates of no-shows at first appointments for counseling. So some good strategies are just make a lot of reminder calls. Be especially welcoming at the first session. Praise them for just making it to the appointment. You know what? Good job for just getting here today. And be culturally aware and sensitive to the extent that you can. Beliefs and attitudes, as I said, toward mental health and substance use vary from culture to culture. There's more stigma in some cultures around one than there is around the other. Intersectionality is a really important term these days. And it's the intersection, we're talking about the intersection of multiple, uh, multiple epidemics or pandemics, uh, in, including the intersection of mental health conditions, substance use and homelessness among youth as well. Risk factors for homelessness among youth, disrupted support networks, Fragile family relationships, so not such good uh, relationships going on at home. The involvement in the foster care system. Substance use is a risk factor for mental health and for homelessness. Um, and traumatic events, as I said, those adverse childhood experiences. Engaging homeless youth. So higher rates of substance use and mental health issues among homeless youth 
than among youth in school, which is not probably terribly surprising, right? Um, try to stay at their level during the first contact. If possible, demonstrate that you're familiar with their culture and with the many challenges of being homeless. Avoid blaming. Try to reframe their current situations, for instance, drug use or living in a shelter um, in non-judgmental, matter-of-fact terms rather than as personal failures. We want to do the best we can to convey a sense of hope and empowerment that change is possible. Many people coming into treatment settings, whether we're talking about mental health, substance use, uh, primary care even, have lost a sense of hope. Um, many of them have been through various systems uh, in the past without much success, it feels like to them. And so we need often to convey a sense of hope and empowerment. You know what? With our help, I believe that you can make this change. Respect their concerns with regard to confidentiality, contacting parents and caregivers, et cetera, mean, making, uh, being especially mindful of California laws around confidentiality um, with regard to mental health and or substance use treatment. Involve families to the extent possible. So adolescents with caregivers involved in the treatment process tend to have better outcomes than those whose caregivers do not believe treatment will help and or are unwilling to work with treatment providers. So get the family members or caregivers involved if you can. And there are some specific strategies for involving families in treatment. So foster family motivation, not just individual motivation, but determine what changes the family member would like to see and try to incorporate them into the treatment goals. Validate the parents or caregivers, acknowledge their sense of stress and their own struggles because most of the time they're going through their own uh, stressful experiences as well, especially in this last year and a half to two years. Provide education about the nature of mental health and substance use issues. For instance, behavioral or emotional problems may not just disappear if the adolescent stops using drugs or alcohol. If the adolescent is using drugs or alcohol to cope with mental health issues or to cope with an ongoing situation at home, for instance, their behavior may actually get worse if they stop using drugs or alcohol before it gets better. Really important that parents and caregivers know that so that they don't say, oh, we're, we've got this kid in treatment now and now he or she is doing worse. Build an alliance, establish rapport, find out what the adolescent would like to talk about so they don't feel like an intervention is being imposed upon them. Try not to come across as the authority figure. Um, find out what they'd like to talk about and then maybe gradually bring the conversation back around to their mental health or substance use issues. Show genuine respect, genuine interest in and respect for his or her unique interests, concerns, and worldview. And if possible, demonstrate an understanding of their culture. Discuss the limits of confidentiality at the beginning of treatment. Plan with the adolescent how information will be communicated to parents and other authority figures. And reassure the adolescent that if you must disclose information, you'll make every effort to talk with him or her before you do it. That's a really important one. Yes, there are situations in which you have to make a report of behavior either to parents or to school authorities, um, but try to have a conversation with the adolescent around that first um, and say, here's what we need to do and try to get them involved in the process so that it doesn't feel like, again, that you're the outside authority figure who is imposing discipline on them. Okay, so some treatment approaches that are adaptable for use with adolescents. Treatment for opioid use disorders includes medications, but treatment for stimulant use disorders is behavioral. So we don't have any FDA approved medications for the treatment of stimulant use disorders like cocaine or methamphetamine, for instance. Um, and so I'm gonna briefly talk about medications for opioid use disorder, knowing that you folks are gonna have, uh, I believe another webinar on this coming up. So I'm just gonna do a very brief overview uh, about those medications. And then we'll talk about motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, using ESPER for youth. The American Academy, Academy of Pediatrics recommends the use of ESPER 
by pediatricians during routine health visits. And in fact, in California, Medi-Cal beneficiaries, youth uh, Medi-Cal beneficiaries are to receive an annual screening in primary care settings. Again, it's important to use a validated screening instrument, such as the CRAFT or the S2BI, because pediatricians' clinical impressions are often not so accurate. However, due to lack of evidence from clinical trials with youth, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force does not currently recommend routine screening by pediatricians, although, as I said, Medi-Cal beneficiaries, um, adolescents 12 to 17, are supposed to get an annual screening. Treating youth opioid use disorder in the pediatric, pediatric primary care setting. So youth opioid use disorder can be treated in a pediatric primary care setting with medications and behavioral interventions. Again, we should engage families of youth in treatment as much as possible because that's demonstrated improved rates of treatment adherence and completion, longer duration of abstinence from drugs, and fewer relapses. Harm reduction strategies or education about opioids are also really important to implement as youth misusing opioids tend to have riskier use practices than adults, like sharing uh, injection equipment, for instance. Youth using opioids, just like adults, are at risk of overdose, um, especially with recent increases in the adulteration of illicit opioids with fentanyl. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that's 50 times more potent than heroin. Think about that for a minute. We know that heroin is a pretty potent drug. Fentanyl is about 50 times more potent than heroin. So a, a potentially lethal dose of fentanyl is two milligrams, which is a tiny, tiny amount. And very often we're seeing heroin, methamphetamine, and cocaine all being adulterated with fentanyl by drug dealers. And so people are buying what they think is cocaine or meth uh, or heroin. Turns out it has fentanyl in it and then they overdose. Overdose education is crucial and should include counseling on strategies for reducing opioid overdose risk, recognizing signs of overdose like breathing, slowing down, uh, and responding to an overdose, including use of naloxone or Narcan, which is the nasal spray. Uh, Jen says, SF is seeing two people a day dying in the streets of fentanyl. Yeah, exactly. The, the, the fentanyl crisis is, is just out of control. Uh, naloxone can be used by non-healthcare professionals. In fact, it's designed to be used by non-healthcare professionals to, to reverse overdose. However, if there was fentanyl in the drug that the person consumed, you may need to use multiple doses of naloxone. So if you stock Narcan, if you stock naloxone for overdoses, make sure that you stock enough of it that you can use two or three potentially doses uh, for one overdose if necessary. Okay, just brief overview of medications. Uh, in 2016, the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Substance Use and Prevention issued a policy statement recommending that medication-assisted treatment be made available to youth and young adults over the age of 16 in primary care and pediatric settings. So this is to be used uh, by 16, 17-year-olds. Can Narcan be distributed to those under 18? Yes, Rachel, it can. Very brief neurobiological interview of, of uh, opioids here. Uh, there are what we call full agonists like methadone, which means if you take, you keep taking it a higher and higher dose, eventually you're going to overdose. There are antagonists like naloxone, which are going to block the effects of the opioid entirely. And then there are what are called partial agonists, which is what buprenorphine or suboxone is. And the idea is that it provides enough opioid effect so that people aren't experiencing withdrawal symptoms and they're not experiencing cravings. And then it levels off and has a ceiling effect so that they're not getting high. So the idea is they're getting enough opioid effect to stave off withdrawal, uh, stave off cravings, but they're not actually getting high on it. Um, that's the idea with Suboxone. Methadone is a full opioid agonist. So if you take too much of it, you can overdose. It's used to treat severe pain and opioid use disorder. It suppresses opioid withdrawal symptoms and, produces, and reduces or prevents cravings. However, it, usually what you have to do is go to every day, uh, go to a federally licensed clinic 
somewhere to get your daily dose of methadone. Um, and there is a lot of historical stigma, as you know, around methadone programs. Although during COVID, the federal government has relaxed those rules to some degree on daily dosing. Uh, and if it appears that someone is stable on a dose, uh, they're able to get like a week's worth to take home so that they don't have to come in every day. The advantages of methadone maintenance therapy, it suppresses opioid withdrawal and reduces cravings. Um, in many studies that have been done over, over with methadone over the years, you will see reduced participation in crime, reduced transmissions of blood, bloodborne viruses like HIV and hepatitis C, and a few long-term side effects. The disadvantages, you are maintaining dependence on an opioid and withdrawing from it or tapering, trying to get off of it can be very challenging and often is very challenging. And so we see people staying on methadone for uh, long periods of time. It requires a daily time and travel commitment, although as I said, that's been to some degree relaxed a little bit during COVID. And it has the potential for diversion. So you can sell your dose of methadone and somebody else could get high on it. Buprenorphine or Suboxone. Uh, buprenorphine is a partial opioid agonist. Uh, so as I said, it provides opioid agonist effects up to a ceiling uh, limit, has a ceiling effect at higher doses. It does reduce uh, withdrawal symptoms and cravings. When you add naloxone to it, so it's buprenorphine slash naloxone, that's what Suboxone is. It becomes very difficult to dilute it and inject it, which reduces diversion and allows for take-home doses. It's usually prescribed in the doctor's office, unlike methadone at a methadone clinic. And historically, it has less stigma than methadone. Uh, Randy, is methadone the cheapest alternative? Um, that is a really good question. I don't know. I don't know the relative cost uh, cost differential between methadone and Suboxone. That's a really interesting question, actually. Naloxone blocks any opioid agonist effect. If the if this so if somebody tries to inject the Suboxone. Uh, it the, the naloxone blocks any opioid effect, so they don't get the effect of the opioid if they try to inject it. But if they take it orally, the way you're supposed to, it passes through the GI tract without being absorbed. Dosage typically starts at four to eight milligrams a day, going up to 16 to 24 milligrams for maintenance. Although some providers uh, tell me that they induct people on 24 milligrams and then gradually taper the dose uh, based on their response. And naltrexone is an opioid antagonist, so it blocks opioid effects. Um, so naltrexone is the third. So there's methadone, suboxone, naltrexone. Um, you have to induct someone on naltrexone after the patient has already gone through detox, because otherwise it will induce withdrawal symptoms. It can be taken orally or as an extended release injection that's called Vivitrol, which you're probably familiar with. You only need to have a Vivitrol injection once a month. So it increases medication adherence because you only have to go once a month. Uh, it increases opioid abstinence and retention and treatment and reduces cravings and relapses. It blocks both opioid and alcohol effects. So opioid pain meds uh, won't be effective if taken while well on naltrexone. So that's the only thing about being on naltrexone is that if you're in a car accident and you have to have surgery and you have to be on opioid pain medications, those pain medications won't be effective if you're taking naltrexone. And then naloxone uh, is the overdose reverser. Uh, so it, it rapidly displaces the opioid molecules like heroin. Uh, it reverses the central nervous system and respiratory depression caused by opioids. So when you overdose by opioids, your breathing stops. It's the respiratory depression that actually causes death. Um, so naloxone reverses that takes effect in two to five minutes and it's available as the nasal spray Narcan or the auto injector at Zio. And it's been distributed to first responders around the country. Uh, Chrissy says they're making Suboxone more affordable with the generic version. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chrissy, with the generic version being available currently, still a bit more expensive than methadone if the patient's having to pay for it without insurance. Yeah, although it is covered, um, by Medicare and Medi-Cal. So that's important to be aware of as well. 
it may not be enough to increase access to medication-assisted treatment in communities of color. Opioids may be a coping mechanism for members of communities that are traumatized by decades of poverty, violence, and neglect. And we need to recognize the value of community-led community needs assessments and routine check-ins uh, so the community, with the community that address the social determinants of health. So it may not be, and I did a, I do a much larger presentation uh, on this topic, but it may not be enough just to increase access to medication-assisted treatment in communities of color. There is still a lot of historical distrust of the medication system, of the sorry, the medical system uh, in communities of color. And MOUD is uh, medications for opioid use disorder. MAT, M-A-T is medication assisted treatment. And we're kind of re gradually replacing that term with M-O-U-D, which is medications for opioid use disorder. All right, a little bit on motivational interviewing and CBT. So motivational interviewing is a client-centered style of interaction aimed at helping people explore their ambivalence about their substance use and begin to make positive behavioral and psychological changes. Developed by Bill Miller and Steve Rolnick uh, over the last 30 years, really, at this point, um, their most recent textbook defines MI this way. It's designed to strengthen personal motivation for and commitment to a specific goal by eliciting and exploring the person's own reasons for change within an atmosphere of acceptance and compassion. A lot of uh, really important language in there that if we had more time, I would go into in a little more detail. The concept of motivation, we used to think of motivation as being a trait, like a personality trait, and it's either there in a particular person or it's not there in a particular person. And if it's not there, then there's not really much we can do about it. Now we think about motivation as being a state rather than a trait. A state is something that changes over time and can be influenced. And so it can be influenced by the clinician's style of interaction with the patient. Uh, motivation can be motiv modified, and our clinician's task is to elicit and enhance motivation. Lack of motivation is a challenge for the clinician's therapeutic skills, not a fault for which to blame our clients or patients. And that can be kind of challenging for some clinicians. That's not to say that we're solely responsible for whether a particular patient or client or student has motivation to stop using or to reduce their use of substances. What it is saying is that if I'm getting a so-called resistant response from someone, I need to step back in that moment and say, okay, is there something about my way of being with this person that is eliciting this response from them? And is there something that I could shift in my way of being with them that might elicit a different response? Four aspects of the underlying spirit of MI, partnership, we're forming a partnership with the, the client or the student, accepting them where they are, being genuinely compassionate, and evocation. So we're evoking their own goals and their own reasons for change. Four processes of MI, engaging, just building the therapeutic relationship, focusing the conversation on what's the problem? What are we here to talk about today? Evoking, again, evoking someone's own reasons for change, evoking their own motivation for change. And then planning, breaking a larger goal down into things that people can work on on a daily basis. Best way to facilitate change. Constructive behavior change comes from connecting with something valued, cherished, and important. And sometimes, we need to help people reconnect with those things within themselves. Intrinsic motivation for change, so within motivation for change comes out of an accepting, empowering, safe atmosphere where people can be honest with themselves about what's going on rather than continuing to avoid the topic or lie to themselves. The provider interaction style is non-judgmental and collaborative. It's based on student and clinician partnership. It's what we might call gently persuasive. We're not going to, going to drag people kicking and screaming somewhere they don't want to go, but we might call it gently persuasive. It's more supportive than argumentative. The minute you get into an argument with someone that they have, saying that they have a problem and they're saying that they don't have a problem, 
you're not likely to get very far. We're definitely doing more listening than telling, and we're, we're doing reflective listening, which we'll talk about in a minute. And the entire approach communicates respect for and acceptance of students' feelings and worldview. And that's one of the reasons why I think MI is really good in terms of uh, cross-culture communication. When we're working with someone, a student who is uh, of a different culture than we are on one level or another, um, MI communicates respect for and acceptance of students just the way they are. And so I think it works well, culturally speaking. It's founded on four basic principles, expressing empathy. So we're listening and trying to get a sense of that person's under, uh, uh, worldview. We're developing discrepancy between their more deeply held values and goals and their current behaviors. So on one hand, you're telling me you wanna finish high school and maybe go to college. On the other hand, you're using Vicodin every other day. Help me make sense of those two things. They don't seem to go together. Rolling with resistance rather than confronting resistance, which is sort of the older, more traditional style of interacting with people around substance use disorders. We're going to roll with resistance. Okay, I can sure understand how it seems that way to you. Can you would you would it be okay if I share with you a slightly different way of looking at the situation? And we want to support a sense of self-efficacy, uh, a sense of if I decide that I want to make this change, do I feel like I have the necessary knowledge and skills and ability to do so? If you just have a few minutes to have a conversation uh, with a student, this can be a helpful uh, just conversation to have. So what are some of the good things about your Adderall use, let's say? What do you like about it? What does it do for you? We want to help, we want to try to get a sense of what is it doing for the student? And then once we have that understanding, okay, now what are some of the not so good things about your Adderall use? Um, we're trying to understand them. We're, we're asking open-ended questions and we're doing reflective listening. We're just trying to understand what does it do for you? And then what are some of the not so good things about it? And we use the, the term not so good purposely rather than bad or negative. Uh, really everything in MI is designed to reduce people's defenses um, so that they will be honest with us. And then what would be some of the not so good things about cutting down or stopping? your use of Adderall. That's going to tell us what are the challenges going to be. And then what would be some of the good things about cutting down or stopping your use of, of uh, Adderall? Using, as I said, open-ended questions. We're affirming people, especially for small steps forward. We're doing reflective listening and we are summarizing. Reflective listening is really the key to establishing empathy. Um, these are the, the four micro skills of MI, uh, open-ended questions, affirmations, reflective listening, and summarizing. And reflective listening is really used to check out whether we really understood the student, highlight the student's own motivation for change, if we can elicit it from them, guide the student towards a greater recognition of his or her problems and concerns, and reinforce statements indicating that the student is thinking about change or what's called change talk in um, MI. So the interaction style and micro skills of, of MI are designed to engage a student in a structured, constructive, supportive conversation about making significant changes like reducing or stopping their substance use. Remember that not everybody is going to walk into your setting and say, okay, yeah, I'm ready to stop using whatever it is that I'm using. They may be willing to say, yeah, it's getting a little out of hand. It's getting a little out of control. So I need to cut down on it. So will you help me to cut down on it? That's a step in the right direction. If that's what they want to set as their goal, great. Let's set that as their goal and see how they do. The approach communicates acceptance and respect for the student while gradually helping to move them toward the choice to make changes that are ultimately in their own best interest. And then a little bit on cognitive behavioral therapy, which can be adapted uh, for use with uh, students as well. Uh, it's a counseling slash teaching approach well suited to the resource capabilities of most programs or clinics. It's been extensively evaluated in clinical trials uh, and has a lot of empirical support, both for mental health conditions like depression and anxiety, as well as for substance use. CBT is collaborative. So it's similar to MI in that we're gonna form a collaborative partnership with the student or with the, the patient or the client. 
It's structured, it's goal-oriented, and it's focused on the immediate problems faced by individuals using substances. It's flexible, it can be individualized. Uh, you can do it, you can use it in a, a wide range of students as well as a variety of settings and formats. It can be done in terms of group, it can be turned, done individually. Uh, there are a lot of different ways that you can make use of CBT. We're gonna conceptualize behavior as substance use as being at least in part a learned behavior. That, that doesn't ignore what happens in the brain with regard to substances, but it does say that substance use is in part a learned behavior uh, that takes place through classical conditioning, operant conditioning, which consists of positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement, and social learning theory. Classical conditioning is really the development of triggers. So repeatedly pairing events, experiences, emotional states, um, people, places, things, with substance use can ultimately produce craving for the substance and over time substance use gets paired with money drug paraphernalia particular places people times of day days of the week emotions you name it uh pretty much anything can become a uh, conditioned trigger and eventually exposure to the cues or triggers alone produces cravings for at least thoughts about drug or alcohol use if not cravings Operant conditioning, positive reinforcement, drug use is reinforced by the positive reinforcement that occurs from the pharmacological properties of the drug. In other words, the high, the euphoria is positively reinforcing. When you're talking about something like methamphetamine, uh, we're talking about stimulants and opioids today. When we're talking about something like uh, methamphetamine, you're talking about a dopamine release of a thousand percent or more of baseline levels of dopamine. Dopamine is the, the brain's central uh, pleasure chemical, if you will, it's a neurotransmitter. Uh, and methamphetamine, all drugs of uh, misuse increase dopamine levels to some degree, but methamphetamine in particular increases it over a thousand percent of baseline levels. And that's incredibly positively reinforcing the brain after just using it two, three, four times, the brain wants more of that and sends us a signal that we need to, to have some more of it. Drug use is often also reinforced by the negative reinforcement of taking away painful withdrawal symptoms or other unpleasant experiences like depression or anxiety. This is why I was emphasizing in, in the studies that show that kids are using in the context of depression or anxiety, that becomes negatively reinforcing. Once they learn that, okay, if I use a little bit of whatever it is, Vicodin uh, or uh, heroin or methamphetamine or whatever it is, and it makes my depression symptoms go away, or it makes my anxiety symptoms go away, it makes my stress about my family go away, that becomes negatively reinforcing and increases the use of the drug or alcohol. CBT, we're going to help students plan, follow a planned schedule of low risk activities. So we're going to identify low risk activities uh, and try to follow a planned schedule of them recognize high risk situations, and to the extent that we can avoid those situations, and then cope more effectively with a range of problems and problematic behaviors that are associated with substance use. So we're gonna help people identify their triggers, avoid those triggers whenever possible. Okay, I usually get high with so-and-so. Okay, would it be possible to avoid so-and-so for a little while? Uh, if it's not possible to avoid them, what's a different way that we could deal with that situation? Friday nights are triggering for a lot of people, right? Can't get away from Friday nights. They're going to roll around every week, whether we want them to or not. So what else could you do differently on a Friday night? CBT is used to teach, encourage, and support individuals about how to reduce or stop their harmful drug use or alcohol use. CBT provides skills that are valuable in assisting people to achieve initial abstinence from substances. Um, it also provides skills to help people sustain abstinence by doing relapse prevention. Start to identifying triggers and what might cause a relapse and then come up with a, a relapse plan uh, for if you find yourself heading in that direction. In the early stages of CBT, strategies emphasize behavior change and include setting a schedule to promote engagement in behaviors inconsistent with substance use. So let's just see if we can come up with a list of things you can do uh, that are not consistent with substance use. 
recognizing and avoiding high risk situations and people and places, et cetera, and facilitating positive, positive coping skills. As CBT continues, more emphasis is given to the cognitive aspects. That includes doing some psychoeducation on the effects of substances in the brain. We find that people who understand what it is that a drug is doing in their brain tend to have better outcomes than those who don't. Teaching them about concepts like this, like triggers and cravings. Teaching them cognitive skills like thought stopping and urge surfing. Thought stopping is find yourself thinking about using pinch yourself on the, on the wrist and make yourself go do something else. Get your mind off it. Urge surfing is plant your butt in a chair, ride it out. If the craving will last more than about 10 minutes. And if you can just sit and know, tell yourself that you don't have to act on the impulse to use, you can in fact, ride it out and identifying red flag thoughts. What are thoughts that are likely to get you into trouble? Oh my God, I need a drink today. I just failed the midterm. I need a drink. So summary of CBT includes behavioral strategies, scheduling and avoidance of high risk situations, cognitive strategies like recognizing triggers and cravings, thought stopping, recognizing red flag thoughts, and analysis of the chain of events that result in a slip or a lapse versus a relapse. If somebody slips on a Friday night and uses, um, we're gonna call that a slip. If they continue using through the weekend and into the following week, we're probably gonna call that a relapse. Um, the language is important because again, relapse has some negative stigma uh, around it. And so if somebody just slips for one night, we're just gonna call that, a, okay, you slipped for a night. Let's get back on the horse and keep going. Optimally, CBT strategies can be used while using a style of interaction consistent with motivational interviewing. In fact, if you're interested, there's a book published in, I think, 2019 on um, motivational using motivational interviewing with cognitive behavioral uh, therapy. So combining the two that I think is really useful. And CBT effects are robust across alcohol and many types of drugs as well. Final note on treatment, involve the parents or caregivers when possible. Again, adolescent substance use often reflects underlying problems or dynamics at home. And so sometimes you get families in, do family therapy is sometimes helpful if the parents or the caregivers are willing to participate in that. Parents are often part of the problem and should be part of the solution when possible. Again, kids are often using uh, because of what's going on at home. They're often depressed or anxious because of what's going on at home. And brief, st brief strategic family therapy is a, is a specific evidence-based approach that can be helpful in changing patterns of family interactions that help to maintain adolescent substance use. So that's a specific uh, intervention that you might want to look into. Candace, I don't have the name of the book in front of me, but if you, if you look it up on Amazon under CBT and motivational interviewing, it will come up. And that is it for me, folks. Uh, any questions uh, or we'll get you, definitely get you a copy of the slides, uh, but I'd be happy to entertain other questions at my email address, which you can't see terribly well there. It's jpeg at mednet.ucla.edu. And with that, I'll stop sharing and turn it over to Lisa. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Peck. Um, I thought that was so interesting and um, I think a really great compliment to what we are going to be covering at the last little bit of today's webinar. Um, so again, hi everyone. My name is Lisa Eisenberg. I'm the policy director with the California School-Based Health Alliance. Um, and in the last half hour of our webinar, um, I'm gonna be covering a little bit about making the connection between what we've all just learned about use substance use and how to respond to the context within many within which many of us are operating in schools and within school discipline policies. So I'm going to cover 
why as school-based providers, it's important to consider some of your clinical practices and clinical training in conjunction with your school policies, particularly around substance use discipline. What we know about use substance use and educational outcomes sort of building off of what Dr. Peck was sharing and how important it is to rethink our school discipline policies and how you can advocate. So um, as school-based health center or school-based health providers, you have the skills, training on how to respond to youth substance, youth, youth health needs, and particularly in, in relation to this webinar around youth substance use. Um, and you all are embedded in school systems. And at least historically, those school systems have responded to youth substance use from a discipline and or zero tolerance perspective. And sometimes that policy, that response to youth substance use can really be in conflict with what you know from your training around how to respond to youth substance use. Um, so I hope that that's what we can add a little bit to today's conversation is how to move away from that punitive response using your public health knowledge, your clinical knowledge around youth substance use. And so on your screen, you kind of see a diagram of school-based health centers, school-based health providers at the core and the school practices and policies within which you are operating. Um, I do really quickly want to acknowledge that today we're talking about discipline responses to substance use. And there are lots of organizations in California that are talking about lots of different discipline responses. Um, and I don't want to ignore that responding to youth substance use is not a separate discipline response to how you might be responding to willful defiance or fighting in the hallways, that this is all thinking about how we're responding to young people and disciplining them in schools in a more holistic, supportive way. Today, we're talking specifically around substance use, but I really want to make sure that it's clear that we are not thinking of this as separate than another, than the whole discipline responses in school settings. And I know there's a, lots of questions and comments in the chat, and I'm not as good as Dr. Beck is responding to them. So we will definitely make sure that there's time at the end to respond to any questions. So a little bit about uh, students and substance use. Um, this is a little bit about the research, what the research says and why I think schools should care about taking uh, an alternative response to punishment to sub youth substance use. So we know that youth substance use is linked to educational outcomes that schools care about. So it's linked to lower grades, it's linked to student absenteeism and higher rates of high school dropout. So we know that it, it impacts educational outcomes for young people. We also know that it's prevalent. So this is different data than um, what was shared earlier, but um, this is from the California Healthy Kids Survey, which is a survey that schools do of students. And it, and it at least um, in 2017, it said that 20% of ninth graders and 29% of 11th graders use alcohol or drugs at least once in the last month. So, um, so we know it's prevalent, and we know that it impacts educational outcomes. And we know that school connectedness can help, or at least is correlated with a decrease in student alcohol or drug use. Um, so the Healthy Kids Survey also measures school connectedness. And this is a measurement based on student responses to five questions in the survey about feeling safe at school, feeling close to people in the school, feeling like they are part of the school, that they're happy at school, and that the treat, teachers treat them fairly. So it's, it's sort of a measure of school climate and, school, and a student's connection to the school. And as you can see, hopefully, in the graph, that a higher level of school connectedness, i.e. those students that feel safe and happy at school, um, the dark blue column is 
um, students are less likely to be using alcohol or drugs in the past month. So high school connectedness, lower alcohol and drug use. And the inverse is correct, is true. So for students with low school connectedness, um, they have higher drug use, drug and alcohol use. So I do think, you know, this isn't causation. This isn't, doesn't mean that schools, when they increase school connectedness, it decreases drug use, but it does suggest that these are, they're connected. And so there is a role that schools can play in addressing students' connection to their school campuses. Um, and rethinking school discipline. So pushing students out of school for substance use infraction doesn't help and it disproportionately pushes out students of color. So this is data from the 2017-2018 school year. Nearly one in seven out of school suspensions and 29% of expulsions were drug related. Uh, I think this include, excludes to tobacco related offenses. I have to go back and look at the data. Um, and then nearly 70% of drug related suspensions in, involve Latinx or black students. And then a student who is suspended or expelled is quite not, not just for substance use, but generally a student who is suspended or expelled is twice as likely to repeat their grade and nearly three times as likely to be in contact with the juvenile justice system the following year. So Expulsions and suspensions impact students beyond just their, um, in, impacts them around their educational attainment and beyond, beyond their education as well. So this slide highlights some of the high level findings that we've included in a resource that is available. It's on our website. It is about school discipline and student substance use student substance use, a guide for school-based health providers. And it unpacks what is in California state law around suspensions and expulsions, particularly for substance use. I think I, I, I'm not a school lawyer. <laughs> I do encourage you, you know, if you are in school settings to, to work with your school communities. But I, I do think I wanna highlight that there is a misconception that schools have to, based on state law, expel or suspend students for substance use. Um, there's only one substance use related infraction that without really any wiggle room that, that um, does require suspension and, ex and recommendation, recommendation for expulsion. And that is for selling a controlled substance on a school campus or on during a school event. Um, so the box on your screen sort of so shows from greatest school discretion and what those infractions are to no school discretion at the bottom. So I do wanna say that in, in California state law, there is some language that schools may suspend or ex expo expel students for certain infractions versus when they must. And even in the orange box where a student must be recommended for expulsion, there is the caveat that unless an alternative means of correction would address the conduct. And so um, language and state law does highlight an alternative means of correction, which I, I think you could make a very compelling argument that there are lots of alternatives to student substance use. Um, that could address the behavior um, and that uh, suspension and in state law, I think it's really important that they do say that suspension should be imposed only when other interventions fail. So I hope, you know, there's lots of details on the slide. I definitely encourage you to check out our guide. And if you take away one thing that there is, there are opportunities to respond differently in school settings. So rethinking school discipline. So um, instead of school push out, which the diagram on your left-hand side sort of shows that, you know, as Dr. Peck explained, there are lots of underlying factors that contribute to youth substance use. If we respond to school push out, that also can re reinforce some of those underlying fa 
factors that lead to youth substance use. So instead of getting sort of caught in the circle on the left hand side, we really encourage you all to think about doing other things like changing school discipline policy and looking up what it says in your student guidebook, in your school policies, in your school board policies around student substance use. Is there a way to, in writing, show alternatives to school push out? Um, are there opportunities to refer students to school-based other school-based health centers or other health providers on the campus or in the community as an alternative to suspension or expulsion? Providing mental health services. We talked a lot about the intersection of mental health needs and substance use behaviors. Um, and is there a way to incorporate comprehensive substance use information in health education classes? Using peer health educators, how can we address and provide prevention models as a way of getting to um, addressing substance use before it becomes a problem where you have to, where schools feel compelled that they have to suspend or expel students? So in our in the guide that I highlighted earlier, we do have a little case study where we included some of, some of this. And if you all are dealing with and trying to address student substance use in non-punitive ways, please let us know. I think one of the challenges um, that we hear is highlighting where this is working and where we've found good models of this. And so please let me know. Um, we'd love to highlight these. But this is a school-based health center that we learned about. Um, at San Fernando High School. This is in, in the San Fernando Valley. It's a LA Unified School. Um, this was an alternative that they put in place where students with an on-campus minor substance use violation um, were given the opportunity to attend four sessions of substance use counseling as an alternative to suspension. Um, and the counseling was provided by an on-site school-based health center, um, and it was run by one of the uh, community-based healthcare provider. Um, so this is an example of um, providing brief intervention or a, a low-level amount of treatment to, for student substance use as an alternative to pushing them out. And, and one of the exciting things that this school saw was at least um, early on in their implementation, or, or in the first year of implementing this, they did see a 64% decrease in suspensions. So this is an example of implementing an alternative um, in this case. I don't, that's a good question. I don't know what they mean by a minor violation. It could mean that it's, it's not selling. Um, selling substances on campus, but that is a great question. I, I, don't know, I don't know exactly what they mean by a minor violation. I've also heard like a first time violation, a second, a first, like sort of, I've also heard of other school-based health centers that have sort of a graduated response. They have a, a response for a first violation, a second violation, and then um, thinking through what those, what those violations mean. Again, I feel like, you know, we also know around substance use that it's, you know, it's not a one one stop shop that solved it, you know, uh, re recurring use is not uncommon. So um, that is also something to, to think about. So this is my last slide. It's quick. I think that that gives us some time to address some of the questions. But um, this is sort of a summary of high level points. Again, this is this is an, an this is a summary that was taken from a second resource that we just released, which is also linked to on this slide. Um, I think there's four, four points that we want you all to take away around making the case. That California state law is, is actually quite clear that there is an opportunity for schools to provide other means of addressing student substance use instead of suspension and expulsion. Um, and I, the second point is that punitive school policies do not address the underlying issues contributing to student substance use. I think oftentimes if we get rid of these kids, then it addresses it. And I think that there's a strong, that, that that's not true. We know that that doesn't address student substance use. Um, and, 
I would even make the argument that it can exacerbate student sub substance use, or at least it certainly doesn't help. Um, this is particular to tobacco use. I'd be interested in knowing if there's similar research. Um, this was CDC has cited that the most effective approaches to helping youth reduce tobacco use are through counseling and education. I don't know whether that applies to other substance use, but this was something that we cited on, on from CDC. Um, and that the, the fourth is school connectedness. School co schools have a role to play through school climate and through supporting young people in connecting them to schools. And that can have a positive impact on student tobacco, on, on how, a how a student uses tobacco or other substance, use, substances. And I think exclusionary discipline policies pushing students out of school runs completely counter to school connectedness. It undermines a student's school connectedness. And so that's that's how important it is, is to, to not rely on exclusionary, exclusionary policies. So those are our four points around making the case. Um, um, for questions, if you'd like to type them in the chat, we can go ahead and um, we can go ahead and respond to those. Um, just to uh, just because questions come up a few times, just to let you all know the webinar and the recording, um, the recording and the slides will be sent out an email after this webinar. Um, we did have a few questions, Jim, um, that came up during. Uh, you will get a copy of the PowerPoint as well um, that came up while you were speaking. Um, one person asked if you have a peer model to suggest. I don't have a specific peer model to suggest. Um, although I, what I would do is maybe take students have been through some sort of substance use intervention and ask them if they would be willing to serve as peer models uh, or peer advisors for their fellow students. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, looks like we have a few questions coming in, so I'll go ahead and move them out. You mentioned great ways to engage youth to get help in and participate in STD treatment, but what can we do to engage youth, af youth after um, they go through STD treatment if they want to continue and have someone hold them accountable? If they want to continue and have someone hold them accountable? Mm -hmm. uh, what can, I, okay, if I'm understanding the, the question correctly, um, I think once you've got somebody engaged, and I think it was someone I saw in the uh, chat box, I think it was Raha, uh, said that once you, she, you get someone, a student to go through the four mandatory sessions of counseling, then they, they wind up staying in mental health counseling for a while after that. And I think that's the way I would kind of answer this question is that if we can get people, if we can get students engaged, in the counseling process, develop a relationship with them um, that they can come back to. If we send them out to a formal substance use uh, treatment program, then they come back in and will be more likely to engage with us if we've been able to establish that relationship with them. Great, thank you. Um, are there any other questions? These aren't questions that I'm seeing in the chat, but sort of comments as well of examples of alternatives to punitive responses. Um, and I don't have an answer for folks, but one thing that I am seeing in the chat is sometimes establishing alternatives where we won't suspend you for X number of days if you do X, X Y, and Z. And I have at least heard from, from folks in the field that, well, that might be an, a, an okay way I don't know, okay is subjective, but a, a way of getting students engaged in some sort of form of treatment, it can often, it sometimes ends up putting the treatment or the alternative in as, as a form of punishment. So if you're not, we're not gonna punish you this way, but we're going to punish you this way um, if you're by doing X, Y, and Z. And so I do think I have heard, um, and this is more, this isn't very specific, but I have heard examples where Schools have had to really do deep work around 
changing the culture of punishment at their school and, and, and saying like, you know, we don't respond with punishment to X, Y, and Z. That's just not what we do. Instead, we provide you with A, B, C, and D because we care about you and we know that you care about our school. And this is about a co collective work that we're all doing. And I know that that is, I acknowledge that that is a, it's a hard thing to implement because it's really relying on school climate and dynamics and some leadership support from the school community. But I do want to just acknowledge because I'm seeing it in the chat as well that it is a it's something that we are we are grappling with about how to support this in the field because it's really hard work um, to respond to young people in a school community in a healthy supportive way as opposed to responding to them with punishment and I do think this this example of this work is is deeply embedded in that challenge so. I at least wanted to acknowledge that. Thanks, Lisa. Um, and a few more come in and we're getting close here on time. How can we provide educators more resources such as Narcan? Uh, Mary Bell, I would suggest reach out to your local law enforcement on that. Um, there are also resources like the Bill and Hillary uh, Clinton Foundation that provide uh, Narcan to uh, first responders and schools, I believe. Thanks, Jen. And do you see more resources emerging, emerging, sorry, emerging for teen substance use? That's a great question. You know, there's, there's a lot of talk about how there is a great need for more adolescent specific focused uh, substance use. And in fact, for those of you who are familiar with the ASAM criteria, the uh, American Society of Addiction Medicine criteria, they talk about adolescent substance use as being different from adult substance use. And yet to, to date, we've only done trainings on adult systems of care. So there's a lot of lip service being paid to the need to create more adolescent substance abuse treatment programs. Um, and I'm not seeing a whole lot of work actually happening to do that, unfortunately. Thanks, thank you. Okay, just for the sake of time, I think we're gonna stop questions there. Um, Jim uh, did mention that we have our next uh, webinar in the series coming up. It is substance use treatment options for adolescents. So he briefly went over that today. Uh, in the webinar, but we'll be going more in depth about that. It will be Thursday, January 20th from 11 to 12 p.m. Pacific time. Um, thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Take care, everyone.